everybody. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me to Finland for the first time. I think I'm going to not use this. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So, I have been studying the effects of infrasound and low frequency noise on health for 30 years. Marianna toivotti teidät tervetulleeksi ja hän kertoi, että hän on opiskellut infraääntä ja matalataajuista melua 30 vuotta. This is a very complicated subject. It involves a lot of economic interests. Tämä on hyvin monimutkainen aihepiiri ja tähän liittyy paljon taloudellisia etuja. And this is why I must put a slide with a disclaimer to say that I am doing this for science. Tämän vuoksi hän on laittanut tuonne tialle niin sanotun disclaimerin, jossa sanotaan, että hän tekee tätä tutkimuksen vuoksi. We have nothing against technology. Heillä ei ole mitään teknologiaa vastaan. And um, our objective is always scientific. Our agenda is the science. It's not the economics. That is not our agenda. So first let's talk. So in this presentation, I will talk to you about infrasound. I will talk to you about measuring infrasound. And then I will talk to you about the biology and the health. In biology, noise is called a physical agent of disease. Physical. Physical agent of disease. Physical. As opposed to biological, viruses, as opposed to chemical, biologiassa virukset ja esimerkiksi sitten kemialliset. And this one is physical. Down fusine. Because it's made of pressure waves. Koska tämä koskee paineautoja. When a pressure wave comes and hits you, it doesn't just hit your ears. Kun paineauto tulee niin se, ja, ja lyö sinua, niin se ei niin kuin, osu ainoastaan korviisi. It hits your whole body. Se osuu koko kroppaan. So, when we are talking about noise, we are talking about a force, a pressure, like this. This is noise. Kun puhumme melusta, niin puhumme paineesta, joka tekee noin kuin hän näyttää, eli se osuu. The World Health Organization calls noise inanimate mechanical forces. Forces and mechanical forces that are not alive. Elikkä VHO kutsuu, kutsuu tätä eloton mekaaninen voima nimellä. Se on tuolla vielä tuolla alirivi. Okay, so when we talk about noise, infrasound, low frequency noise, or the noise that we can hear, we are always talking about a force a pressure that's coming in the air and it's hitting our bodies. So what's the difference between the noise that we hear and this infrasound that we don't hear? Can you see the mouse? No, it's okay. You see the top wave and the bottom wave. The distance in the top wave, the distance between the peaks is small, yes? And the bottom wave, the distance between the peaks is big, yes? The characteristics of infrasound and low frequency noise is that the distance between the peaks is very big. So 
So in terms of nature, what happens, when you have the small distance waves coming in to the Earth, the Earth reflects it on the sun. Eli tuossa toisella puolella oikeanpuolimaisessa kuvissa, niin nuo, nuo pienet, eh, pienet aallot, eli, eh, joo, eli ne tulee tuolla maahan ja ne törmää sitten, eli ne on noita korkeita, korkeita niin kuin, aaltoja, joissa on tiuka se aallon väli. But when the distance between the peaks is very big, the wave comes and penetrates, it's not reflected. Mutta sitten jos tämä aalto on tuollainen pitkä ja loiva, eli, eli siellä ihan oikean toimimaisessa kuvassa, niin se tunkeutuu maahan, se ei sitten törmää pois niin kuin tuossa toisessa. Okay. So, when we hear, when human beings hear, they hear the waves where the distance is in centimeters. Kun ihminen kuulee ääniä, niin niissä tämä huippujen väli, eli mä puhun aallonpituudesta tässä, niin se on ehkä selkeämpi meille. Se, se on pieni, eli, eli tuota, tuo ylempi kuva, kaikkein ylhäisi kuva, niin se, se on se, mitä me kuullaan. So if you look at those numbers, at 3000 hertz, we humans hear very, very well. At 3500 hertz is where the baby cries. Eli nyt jos katsotaan noita hertsilukuja tuolla ensin tuossa lokerossa, niin se 3000 hertsiä, siellä se... se näiden huippujen väli on vain senttimetreissä ja sitten kun katsotaan tuolla, mikä on vauvanippu, niin se on 3500 Hz. So when we go down into the lower frequencies, notice that the numbers at 20 Hz, which is the limit, considered to be the limit of human hearing, 20 Hz, the distance between the peaks is 17 meters. Ja nyt sitten kun puhutaan tuosta 20 hertsistä, jota pidetään kuuloalueen niin alarajana, niin tämä näiden huippujen väli on 17 metriä. Metreistä puhutaan nimenomaan. Not in the centimeters. Ei senteistä. The centimeters is what's going to affect your ear. Se on se, mikä vaikuttaa korviin, eli tämä senttimetreissä oleva pieni ero. But when you go into meters, meters, then it affects the body. Mutta sitten kun puhutaan metreissä näitä, tästä aallon huippujen välisestä erosta, niin se on se, mikä vaikuttaa meidän kehoihin. We all know about radiation, right? Me kaikki tunnemme säteilyn, eikö vaan? We all know that there is a, in the spectrum of radiation there is a part we can see. Eli tässä säteilyn spektrissä on tietty osa, joka me voidaan nähdä. And then there's an X-ray part where we can see an ultraviolet and infrared. There's all this other stuff that we don't see, right? Sitten on myös paljon sitä, mitä me ei voida nähdä, eli esimerkiksi röntgenaalot ja, ja infrapuna ja, ja näitä muita, mitä siellä on luetellut. It's similar in acoustics. There is a section that we can hear, the audible sounds. <köhön> Akustiikassa on samoin, eli siellä on tietty jakso, joka me voidaan kuulla. And then there's a whole part that we don't hear, ultrasound, infrasound. Sitten on paljon sitä, mitä me ei voida kuulla, eli ultraäänet, infraäänet. What is the problem here in science? Mikä tieteessä on sitten tässä se ongelma? Look how the electromagnetic spectrum is segmented. Look, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, FM, TV, segmented, yes? Eli kun katsotte tuolta ylhäältä, miten tämä säteily on. And we all know that the health effects of x-rays are different than the health effects of UVs, UV radiation, right? Eli kun katsotte sitä, kuinka se on siellä pätkin pienin osi tuo, tuo säteilyn kohdalta, ja me tiedämme, kuinka sitten osa näistä esimerkiksi röntgenaalot vaikuttaa ihmisen terveyteen. And these effects are different. The effects of X-rays are different than the effects of ultraviolet because of the frequency is different. But now look at the acoustic spectrum. Do we have that segmentation to study? All we have is audible, ultrasound, and infrasound. That's it. Eli kun meillä on siellä nyt sitten vain se kuultava osuus, ultraäänet ja infraäänet ja siinä se. 
So, if we know that the lungs are susceptible to one frequency. Eli jos me tiedämme että keuhkot keuhkoihin vaikuttaa joku tietty and the liver to another. Ja vaikka maksa on joku toinen. How do I study that in the acoustic spectrum when they're not making any segmentation? Infrasound is all put in the same bag. Eli miten sitä tutkitaan sitten tämän akustisen niin näkemyksen kannalta, kun näitä ei ole pilkottu pienempiin osiin, vaan se kaikki pannaan suurin piirtein samaan koriin. So how can I study with you what are the frequencies that are making your lungs go crazy, your eyes go crazy? I can't. There's no segmentation. Eli millä tutkitaan sitten se, jos keuhkoissa on oireita tai silmissä on oireita, niin se on se ongelma, että tuolla ei ole jaottelua. So this is one of the big problems of why you are all here, of why nobody is accepting that this sort of noise makes a health problem. Ja tämä on se kysymys ja, ja myös se, miksi te olette täällä. Eli, eli ei ole sellaista selvää jaottelua, millä voitaisiin sanoa, että miten se vaikuttaa terveyteen. Now for the second problem. Sitten toinen on. This is again the frequencies, uh, the acoustic spectrum. It goes from 20 to 20,000 hertz, as we know. Eli nyt tässä on tuo kuultava äänen osuus 20 hertzistä 20,000. Humans do not hear the same throughout all the spectrum. Ihmiset ei kuule niin kuin kaikkea sillä, tällä spektrillä niin, niin alusta loppuun samalla lailla. There's a particular area which in that graph is shown by a dark green circle. Tuolla on merkattu tummavihreällä ympyrällä tuo tietty alue. That is where we talk. Se on keskustelualue. Right there is important to protect the hearing at those frequencies at which we talk. That's important. Eli siellä on tärkeää suojata kuuloa noilla taajuuksilla missä keskustellaan. When we lose our hearing, the worst part is what? I can't understand what you're saying. Eli se on tärkeää, koska sitten jos menettää kuulonsa, niin ei kuule mitä toinen sanoo. So historically, when we want to protect people against noise, we protect what? The hearing, which is the part where we're speaking. Eli historiallisesti ajateltuna, niin jos me halutaan suojata ihmisiä, niin me suojataan tuota kuulualuetta. All the rest, you see that light green bubble? Sitten siellä on se vaalea vihreä alue. That doesn't matter. Sillä ei ole niin väliä. Because we don't really speak there. Really, really, we want to protect the frequencies of the green, the dark green circle. Koska me halutaan suojata tuota kuula aluetta, niin tuolla lopulla nyt ei ole niin väliä. So, many years ago, scientists decided that it was important to go into an environment and measure the noise, not all of it, I don't care about all of it, I just want to measure the noise that is going to make people deaf. Eli monta vuotta sitten tieteentekijät päätti, että tutkitaan sitä alueita, jossa ihmiset voi tulla kuuroiksi, eli tuota kuulevamme alue. We don't speak in infrasound, so who cares about infrasound? Emme puhu infraäänillä, joten kukapa niistä väittää. So how did scientists go about doing this? Eli mitenkä sitten tutkijat tämä tekee? They invented the DBA. He keksivät tämän DBA-mittauksen. You've heard about the DBA. Olette varmaan kuulleet siitä. Everybody's heard about the DBA, right? So what does this DBA do? Eli mitä tämä tekee? Millainen mittari tämä on? It really allows you to go into an environment with a microphone and it's like you put a filter on the microphone. And the only thing that you are reading is what the human would hear if they were there. Eli siinä mennään käytännössä mikrofonin kerran ja pannaan siihen filtteri ja sitten tutkitaan sitä, mitä ihminen kuulisi. That's what the DBA does. And it's good, guys. It's good. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's good to protect the hearing. Se ei ole mikään salaliittoteoria. Se on ihan hyvä juttu. Sillä niin kuin yritetään suojata kuulua. Okay. So... Let's look at that. I can't reach up there and I can't point. So, um, <laughs> you see down here frequencies where it says 1,000 to about 10,000. You see that section? The graph? Eli tuossa alhaalla on noita ajuudet. Siinä näkyy nyt vaikka tuo tuhat ja kymmenet. 
the blue curve in that section is almost a straight line, is it not? Eli 1000 ja tuo on lähes suora. Only there, yes? Mutta vai siellä. So let's go now to see what that straight line goes to, zero, yes? Mutta sitten katsokaa tuonne nollan suuntaan mennessä, niin, niin mitä se sitten tapahtuu tuolla vasemmalla tuo nolla, nolla Yeah, what does that mean? It means that at these frequencies between 1000 and 10,000, if you measure with a DBA the difference of what is in the machine and what is in the environment, the difference is zero. Eli te silloin jos mennään tuonne ympäristöön, mitataan sitä melua 10 000 Hz, niin silloin se ero tämän mittalaitteen ja sen ympäristön suhteen niin se on nolla. Eli, eli siis se on tarkka mittaus. So with the DBA, at these frequencies, it's good. What you are measuring is really what is there. That's good. Eli näillä taajuuksilla tuo DBA mittaus on hyvä. Now let's go to the 10 Hz. You see 10 hertz there in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mut sitten kun katsotaan mitä tapahtuu tuolla 10 Hz kohdalla. And vasemmat. what number does the blue line correspond at 10 Hz? It's 70 dB. Yeah. Eli kun katsotaan mikä siellä sinisellä käyrällä on 10 Hz kohdalla, niin se on 70. And what does this mean? Mitä se tarkoittaa? It means that when you are measuring with dBA at 10 Hz, the difference between what your machine says and what is there is 70 dBs. Eli siinä on 70 desibeli ero sen suhteen, mitä ympäristössä on melua, ääntä, ja se sitten se laite näyttää. So imagine in your car, you have a speedometer, yeah, for the speed of your car, how much you are going. Ajatelkaa auton nopeusmittaria. Now imagine it measures a difference of 70 miles per hour kilometers. How good would that speedometer be, huh? Jos siinä olisi 70 kilometri heitto tunnissa, niin kuinka hyvä se mittari olisi? Imagine you're stopped and it says you're going 70 miles an hour. Sitten kun olette pysähtyneet, niin aina vain se näyttää 70 tunnissa. That's what's happening when you're measuring infrasound with the DBA unit. Eli tämä tapahtuu silloin, kun infraäätä mitataan DBA yksiköllä. Anything below 500 uh, hertz, if they come to you and they say, oh, look, we, we measured your infrasound, it's 30 dBAs, you can laugh in their faces. You can laugh in their faces and I will applaud you. Eli jos tällä mittayksiköllä on mitattu, mitään 500 hertzin alle menetään, niin voitte nauraa. You cannot quantify infrasound and low frequency noise with a dBA unit. It's not scientific, I mean, come on. Infraääntä ja matalata, jos melua ei voi mitata dpa yksiköllä se ei ole tieteellistä. So all these health studies out there and the ones to come, Eli what are they going to do with the noise? Are they going to measure it in DBA? Eli kun ajatellaan kaikkia terveystutkimuksia, joita on tehty ja, ja niitä, joita tulee. Not if he's involved, right? <laughs> niin, niin, mitä siellä jo mahdetaan tehdä, että mitataanko dpa yksiköllä Not if he's involved, not if I'm involved. <laughs> It's very complicated in human societies to change something that has been in place for over 60 years now. On vaikea yhteiskunnassa muuttaa semmoista, mikä on ollut voimassa yli 60 vuotta. And the DBA was developed, do you know why? Ja arvatkaa, miksi DPA kehitettiin? For the telephone! Puhelin. In 1920! 20-luvulla. <laughs> I'm not joking. Harvey Fletcher, the first president of the Acoustic, uh, Acoustical Society of America, was the first guy, him and his colleagues, to develop this, what then became DBA curve. Eli Harvey Fletcher, Amerikassa puhelinalan pioneeri, niin hän kehitti tämän DPA, mitä yksikö? 1920s. 20-luvulla puhelintavaa. That was 100 years ago. Siitä on 100 vuotta aikaa. And we're still using it. Me aina sitä käytetään. All right, what you see now Eli se, mitä nyt näette tässä, is kind of like a movie of an acoustic environment around wind turbines. On ikään kuin akustinen elokuva tuulivoimalla te ympäristössä. I want you to look at the two bars on the right. Eli katsotaan oikealla näitä kahta kylpästä. The two ones. The little one that almost never moves, the little one. Tuo pieni, joka ei oikeastaan liiku. That's DBA. So DBA. 
If you go into this environment and measure with DBAs, that little red bar that you see there is what you will get. Eli jos sinne mennään ja mitataan ne DBA yksiköllä, niin tuo pieni punainen palkki on se, mitä siellä saadaan. Now the other bar on the other side, the one that's always going up and down. Ja sitten toi toinen palkki, joka menee ylös ja alas. That's what's really there. Se on se, mitä siellä ympäristössä on oikeasti. So if you are in this environment, Eli jos te tässä ympäristössä, legislation would say to you, laki sanoo teille, you are not exposed to anything above 40 dBA. Eli silloin te ette esimerkiksi altistu millekään, joka ylittää 40 desibeliä. That little red bar never goes above 40 dBA. Tuo pieni palkki ei koskaan ylitä sitä 40 dBA. But your body is exposed to that other bar, the one that's going like this. Mutta teidän keho on silti altistunut sille, mitä tuo toinen punainen pysty palkki näyttää. Guys, for scientists, this is not a simple prospect to analyze how something like that affects your health. Ei ole kauhean yksinkertaista analysoida sitä, mitä tällainen vaikuttaa terveyteen. Not only will it depend on how high it goes and how long it lasts. Siinä on sekä se, että kuinka ylös se menee, että kuinka kauan se kestää. But it will depend on something else that most people doing health studies forget to take into account. Mutta lisäksi siinä on semmoinen seikka, mitä niin kuin useimmat ihmiset terveystutkimuksessa ei ota huomioon. Your prior noise exposure. Aiempi. Individually. Aiempi melulle altistuminen yksilöllisesti, eli siis per kukin meistä, mitä on aiempi historia. When I interview people exposed to low frequency noise, kun hän haastattelee ihmisiä, jotka, jotka tuota, niin on altistunut matalataajuiselle matala melulle. My first question is, ensimmäinen kysymys on, where was your mother pregnant with you? Missä äitisi oli, kun hän odotti sinua? Do you know why? Arvaatteko miksi? Fetal exposure. That's where it begins. Se alkaa jo sieltä altistuksesta odotusaikana. That's where it begins. So if you want to do a health study and you don't take into account people's prior exposures, your statistics will be inconclusive. Eli jos ette ota huomioon sitä, mikä ihmisten aikaisempi altistuminen on, niin, niin se, se ei näissä tieteellisissä tutkimuksissa ole hyvä tapa. Right. When we're going into the health, I'm going to go back to the acoustics. Nyt mennään takaisin akustiikkaan. We have now our group, and I have, I'm sure... Uh, Uh, we are now measuring, not with DBAs, course, but with what we call DB linear. Now let's look at that one. Let's look at 100 hertz. Go up to the graph and go to that side. What does it read? Zero. Eli mennään tuosta sadasta hertzistä tuonne käyrälle ja se menee asemalle nollaa pitkin. That means that 100 hertz, if we measure with this, the difference between what we measure and what's there is zero. Eli se ero, mitä ympäristössä on ja, ja mitä se mittari näyttää, on nolla. At 10 hertz, the difference between what we measure and what's there is zero. Kymmenessäkin hertzissä se ero on edelleen nolla. At one hertz, the difference between what we measure and what's there is zero. Ja jopa tuolla yhdessä hertzissä mittarin ja ympäristön ero on nolla, eli, eli se näyttää tarkasti. So, of course, if you want to quantify infrasound with low frequency noise, you must use at least a dB linear and not, of course, a dBA. Eli jos halutaan mitata matalataajuista tai melua tai infraääntä, niin pitää käyttää vähintään tätä dB lineaaria. I'm going to give you another example. This one uh, was published back in 2003. So we have three environments, the cockpit, a train, and the car. And look at the DBA levels, they're about the same. Right, 72.1, 71.4, 71.2, they're about the same, right? So scientists out there will tell you, oh, the DBA is the same, 
So they are acoustically equivalent environments. In theory, if I put a rat in the car, a rat in the cockpit, and a rat in the train with the same amount of time, they will develop the same problem. Eli teoriassa, jos pannaan rottatuoneen, lentokoneen ohjaamoon tai junaan tai autoon, niin niille tulee samat oireet. Because the DBA level is the same, right? Koska tuo DBA taso on sama, eikö vaan? Let's see if that's true. Katsotaanpa, onko totta. The black bars represent the cockpit. Eli nämä mustat palkit on nyt sieltä lentokoneen ohjaamosta. The blue bars represent the train. Ja vaaleammat on, no siniset on sitten täältä junasta, pysähtyneestä junasta. The DBA level is similar, which means that either in the train or in the cockpit, you would hear similar stuff. But look at the DB linear values. In the cockpit it's 83, but in the train it's 92. Ja sitten kun katsottekin mitä DPA lineaari näyttää, niin, niin toisessa se on, on yli 80 ja, ja toisessa, äh, nyt näin itse näin, niin yli 90. Mutta kuitenkin ne numerot, jotka tuolla näkyy sinisellä, niin so, ne eroaa. So in the cockpit and in the train I hear the same. Eli me kuullaan näissä ne ihan se sama. But in the train my body is exposed to much more. Mutta sitten siellä junassa keho on altistunut paljon enemmän. And now notice in the middle you have the blue bars a little bit higher than the black bars. Do you see that? At those frequencies, the cockpit and the train are completely different environments. Look at them, they're different in terms of frequencies. Alright, so let's look at the car. The black bars are the cockpit. Nämä mustat on sille The red bars and pink bars, whatever, are the car. Ja nämä punaiset tai pinkit ovat sitten auto. In the cockpit or in the car, I would hear about the same, 72 and 71 dBA. Ja taas me suurin piirtein se sama. But in the car, I'm exposed to much more, a hundred dB. Mutta sitten täällä autossa kuitenkin altistutaan paljon enemmälle, noin sadalle. This is my car. Se on hänen autossa. This is my Fiat Punto. When it was new. Mutta it was new. Now it's not new. Now it must be much noisier. And these measurements were taken at 3 o'clock in the morning on a highway at a steady speed. Windows closed, radio off. So this is really no, no traffic was going by. So this is really the aerodynamic car and sound of the car inside. Eli kun nämä mittaukset tehtiin motoritiellä yöllä, silloin kun siellä ei ollut muuta liikennettä ja ja saatiin niinku se se muu häly suljettua pois, eli ei ollut taustahälyjä ja ja tota niin tuo on se mikä siellä niinku auton ohjaamossa mille altistuu. So this is the second big problem when we try to study scientifically the health effects of this type of noise on you guys. Everybody's measuring in DBAs. <laughs> so you can't study anything, do you understand? We have not the knowledge of the frequencies. I'm going to give you another example of DBAs and DB linears and new methodologies for measuring noise. Hän antaa toisen esimerkin tästä DBA ja DB lineaari ja sitten uuden mittaustavan asioista. You may have heard of this case. It's the case of the mink farm in Denmark that now has four wind turbines and all the mink are dying, etc., etc. Olette ehkä kuulleet Tanskassa minkkifarmista, siellä oli neljä tuulivoimalaa ja lähellä ja, ja näitä minkkejä kuoli. We were there and we measured with our new equipment, we also we all have now new equipment because the DBA isn't working, right? So um, we measured with our new equipment and we measured where the mink were. We had two locations, location one was an older shed and location two is a more modern shed. He menivät sinne ja mittasivat uusilla mittalaitteilla kahdesta paikasta, 
ensimmäinen oli vanha vaja ja, ja toinen sitten tämmöinen uudempi. Right. So, tulee sitten niistä kuvia. Because we are have other things to talk about, I'm only going to show you location two. Eli hän näyttää nyt tänne sijaan niin kaksi mittapisteitä. You see those red bars? Eli kun katsotte noita punaisia palkkeja. That's the only thing legislation tells you to measure. Se on se, mitä lain mukaan mitataan. So, the square on the left shows the acoustical environment without the wind turbines rotating. They are stopped. Eli tässä vasemmalla tuulivoimalat ei pyöri. Se, ne harmaat näyttää sitten sitä. Ei pyöri. And on the right, the same exact positions of the microphones, locations, but with the wind turbines rotating. Ja oikealla sitten pyöri mm -hmm. Eli voitte verrata niitä punaisia ja, ja noita harmaita. You see a big difference in the red bars? Do you really see a big difference in the red bars? Näettekö niissä punaisissa suurenkin eron? Or do you see a big difference in the gray bars? Vai niissä harmaissa? The gray bars are not measured. It's infrasound and low frequency noise. No, nobody cares. Eli ne harmaat on niitä infraääniä ja matala taivuisia, joista kukaan ei välitä. The only thing that legislation requires you to measure under these circumstances are those red bars, which practically don't change much between with wind turbines and without wind turbines. But we are now measuring with other devices. And why is this much more important? Eli, miksi tää on hyvin because these types of devices, like an, 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 sorry, um, they allow for us to put in time. Eli nämä, nämä laitteet, niin kuin Antilla, niin ne, ne päästään niin kuin lisäämään no näihin ajan. Eli näissä aikaisemmissa kaavioissa ei näy aika. There's no time with this data. This is a picture, it's a snapshot. That's it. But with this data, if you notice on the left, from the top to the bottom is 600 seconds. On the left, it's the same exact data from here. So on the left there are no wind turbines and on the right there are wind turbines. Are there any questions really? The dBs, the intensity of the sound, is given by the colors. You have almost only blue on this side when there are no wind turbines. And then on this side when you have the wind turbines rotating, look at all the acoustic energy in the yellows and the reds. Eli nyt tässä vasemmalla, kun tuulivoimalla ei, ei pyöri, niin väri on tällainen, ja sitten oikealla se akustinen energia, mikä, mikä siihen ympäristöön aiheutuu, näkyy, kun voimalla pyörii. And since you have time, from up there to down, it's 600 seconds, it's 10 minutes, we can see what's going on in each second. And so, we can discover the pulses, which is absolutely important to determine what happens to your health. Eli nyt kun siinä sitten näkyy tuo aikajana, niin pystytään näkemään, mitä siellä tapahtuu sekunti sekunnilta. Ja, ja se on olennaista terveyden kannalta, koska sieltä saadaan myös ne pulssit näkyy. This is the same exact data with another vision. Nyt tässä on ihan se sama, sama data, taas erilainen kaavio. The blue line indicates the noise when there are no wind turbines. Eli toi sininen kuva melua silloin, kun voimalat ei ole päällä. And the red line indicates when there are wind turbines. Ja punainen sitten sitä, kun ne ovat päällä. Now look at the red line. You see the peaks? Katsokaa tuota punaista käyvää. Näettekö ne kuivut? These peaks are mathematically spaced. There's a mathematic relationship between the spaces of each peak. Ne on matemaattisesti tarkkoja, eli ne toistuu. Toistuu siellä samoilla. So it's not wind. Se ei ole tuulta. Wind does not blow. Right? Tuuli ei tuule tuolla tavalla. 
So they can't now say, oh, this noise that we found in your house, maybe it's wind. We have to come back with no wind when the wind turbines are not rotating either, right? Eli ei voida sanoa, että, että hei, että se on tuulta, että se melu, mikä tehdään talosta, kuitenkin on tuulta, me tullaan sitten takaisin, kun ei tuulta. So this is where we are right now in terms of quantifying the agent of disease. Eli nyt ollaan siinä tilanteessa, että mitataan taudin aiheuttaja. You understand that for human health, <coughs> for anything, chemicals, anything, you have normally what is called dose-response relationships. So, when we're talking about infrasound and low-frequency noise in health, it is important to start thinking about determining dose-response relationships. On tärkeää miettiä myös sitä annostuvastisuudetta. Right? So I can know how long you can stay in your house without getting sick. Että tiedän, kuinka kauan voit pysyä kotona siihen, vaikka on kipeässä. We cannot get, thank you, those response relationships if we're measuring the agent of disease in DBAs, meaning we're not measuring it. Emme voi miettiä, että mikä se annostuvastisuudet on, jos mitataan DBA yksiköllä. So these new equipments that are starting to come out are essential for quantifying the agent of disease that is present and later establishing those response relationships. Okay. That ends the part of the acoustics. Now it's going to the part of the health. And specifically vibroacoustic disease. Yeah, erityisesti the VAD, eli eli vibroacoustisen. So vibroacoustic disease, the study of it began in 1980. Eli tämä vibroacoustisen on yhtymä tutkimus alkoi 1980. Led by Dr. Nuno Castello Branco. Yeah, sitä johti tämä niminen lääkäri. Castello Branco. Castello Branco. And he was a pathologist medical pathologist Hän oli patologi. and the colonel in the Portuguese Air Force. Not general. Oh. <laughs> he was an officer in the Portuguese Air Force. <laughs> so to protect his workers, the first thing he did when he uh, began serving in this Air Force base, he went to visit all the workstations of his workers to Eli, see. Oh, mm -hmm. Eli hän meni lentotukikohdalla käymään kaikkien työntekijöiden luona, nähdäkseen heidän työolosuhteet. To see what would be the problems, what he should worry about in terms of protecting his workers. Ja pitäisikö hän olla huolissaan joistakin seikoista, että suojelisi työntekijöitä. So I'm sure maybe none of you have an airplane. <laughs> but if you did, <laughs> you would know that after maintenance on an airplane, you put the airplane on the tarmac, on the ground, stopped, and you test all the engine regimes while it's stopped on the ground. Ja, ja sitten pannaan hallintalaitteet päälle. And while this is happening, you have quality control personnel going around the aircraft with checkers. Ja sitten siellä on tätä laadunvalvontahenkilöstöä, joka kulkee lentokoneen ympäri ja tsekkaa. These are military planes. They're not civilian planes with nice, beautiful noise reduction stuff in it. Ja no nyt, noise reduction in the military. Nyt on puhe sitten, sitten tosiaan niin sotilaslentokoneista eikä... So this makes an awful lot of noise. Can you imagine? You know, engines stopped. It's not flying over. It's just like there with all these engines going. So while Dr. Branco is watching, what is this called a run-up test? While Dr. Branco is watching. He sees one of the workers starting to walk without purpose, going towards the exhaust of the airplane. Hän näki kuinka yksi työntekijä lähti hoitertelemaan näitä 
turbiinien siihen poistoilmaan tulevaa sitä kohti. And a colleague grabbed him and it stopped there. The incident stopped there. A colleague grabbed him. Kollega tarttui häneen ja se, se tapaus niin päättyi siihen. But Dr. Branko saw this. Mutta tämä tohtori näki sen. And he went to the colleague and said, asked him, why, what happened? You had to grab your co-worker. What happened? Hän meni tämän, tämän kollegan luo, eli sen, sen työntekijän luokse ja kysyi, että mitä siellä niin tapahtui, että miksi sinun piti ottaa kiinni sitä kaverista. And the guy said, oh, that sometimes happens. Hän sanoi, että no, joskus näin käy. In the 60s there was a guy, we could not hold him in time and he died. This is not what a doctor wants to hear. Yeah, this is not what a doctor wants to hear. <coughs> the safety of your workers cannot be dependent on your colleague grabbing you, huh? But this reminded Dr. Branko of something of an epileptic nature, this without purpose movement. So he went back through all the medical records of all these workers that are on site at the medical site since they come in to work at the base. Hän meni ja kävi näiden kaikkien työntekijöiden eh, potilaskertomukset läpi, koska ne oli kaikki tallella siellä siitä lähtien, kun he oli tulleet töihin. And he found that 10% of these workers had already been diagnosed with late onset epilepsy. Ja hän huomasi, että työntekijöistä 10 prosenttia oli jo diagnosoitu aikuisia epilepsialla. And the general population in Portugal, the general expected rate is 0.2. Kun sitten Portugalissa muuten tämä epilepsia luku kokonaisväestössä on 0,2. And hence became, began the big neurological study of these workers. Ja sitten näitä työntekijöitä alettiin niin tämän tapauksen pohjalta tutkiin neurologisesti. So all of these tests that we gave them were essentially to test their neurological function and they came back pathological. Eli nämä kaikki, mitä, mitä he tekevät, niin tämä on lähtenyt niin näistä neurologisista tutkimuksista ja, ja sitten päädytään patologisiin. For example, evoked potentials, it's, you know, you put a cap on and the computer measures the time it takes for your brain to respond. Eli esimerkiksi päähän laitetaan sellaiset tietyt piuhat ja, ja sitten mitataan, kuinka kauan aivoilla on niin se vasteaika, että reagoi johonkin. And in a group of average age 42-year-old aircraft technicians, in a group of 42 average age, the results were like they were 80-year-olds. Eli tämä 42 hengen niin keski-ikä, tai keskimääräisessä joukossa sieltä näistä työntekijöistä, niin saatiin tulokseksi, että he heidän... This is one of the tests you all should be doing. Tilansa vastasi 80. Tällainen testi pitäisi tehdä kaikille. Cognitive. In 1983, one of the aircraft technicians died suddenly. Sitten vuonna 1983 lentokoneet teknikko kuoli äkillisesti. Dr. Branko wanted to do the autopsy to understand why he died. Tämä tohtori Branko halusi tehdä ruumiin avauksen, jotta hän olisi saanut selville, että miksi näin käy. No, said the family. Mutta perhe ei antanut kuvaa. No, 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 no. And the autopsy was not done. Eikä tätä ruumia vasta tehty. But there was a colleague who understood the importance of having an autopsy. Mutta yksi kollega ymmärsi sen tärkeyden, miksi olisi pitänyt ruumia vasta tehdä. So he went to the notary and got a will demanding an autopsy by Dr. Branko when he died. Hän meni sen takia asiaajan luo ja, ja teki semmoisen testamentin, että hänelle itselleen pitää tehdä ruumiavaus sitten, kun hän kuolee ja, ja nimenomaan tämän tohtori Branko toimesta. And of course Dr. Branko was very, you know, uh, emotional. Please, of course, thank you, it's very good, but I'm going to die before you, so I'm not going to do any autopsy. Please don't think about this. It's very nice of you to do this, thank you, but please don't think I'm not ever going to do your autopsy. Mutta tämä tohtori Branko tietysti sanoi, että totta kai kiva, että, että kyllä kiitos tehdään vain, mutta minä kyllä kuolen ennen sinua. September, 7 o'clock in the morning, 
o'clock in the morning, yeah. September 1987. 1987, yes. And Dr. Branco receives a telephone call from the man saying, Doctor, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to die. I have called the ambulance. Please meet me at the hospital to make the autopsy. And Dr. Branko, of course, said, no, you're not going to die. I'm glad to call the ambulance. I will meet you at the hospital. Please don't worry. And when the doctor got there, the man was dead. Dr. Branko said, no, you're going to die. I'm glad to call the ambulance. I'm going to the hospital. But when he came to the hospital, the man was dead. And the autopsy was performed. Yes, it was done. And what we found was extraordinary, many extraordinary things. One of them was thickening of cardiovascular structures. Ja se sitten mitä löydettiin, niin löydettiin monenlaisia asioita, eli yksi näistä oli, oli tämän kardiovaskulaarin paksuutuminen. This man, each time you have a heart attack, eli joka kerta jos ihmisellä on sydänkohtaus, a little scar forms in your heart. This man had 11 scars. He died of the 12th. In his medical record, there is no registry of a heart attack. These are what are called silent ischemic events, common among people exposed to infrasound and low frequency. Näitä sanotaan hiljaisiksi iskemisiksi tapahtumiksi ja, ja, ja on tyypillisiä infraäänelle altistuneita. Your cardiovascular problems that everybody says that you have when you live near noise, road noise, urban noise, this is why. Tämä on se, miksi on kardiovaskulaarisia ongelmia silloin, jos asuu meluisien alueiden. Because road noise and urban noise also have infrasound and low frequency noise. Koska myös sitten, sitten eri, erilaisissa ääniympäristöissä voi olla myös sitä infraääniä. The importance of this autopsy, though, was to show that this pathology is not only in the central nervous system. This is your heart. Around the heart you have a very thin sac called the pericardium. The pericardium has to always accompany the movement of the heart. What did we find in autopsy? We found that this pericardium got very, very thick. What you are looking at is the pericardium of a patient with heart disease not caused by noise. And on this side is a guy with heart disease caused by noise. What you are looking at is the pericardium. It's the thickness of the pericardium. On this guy, it's thin. It's practically normal. This guy was subjected to open heart surgery because he had cardiovascular disease. Just not caused by noise. This one also had cardiovascular disease, but caused by noise because his pericardium is very thick. We never see this anywhere except in people exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise. But the right side of the image is the person who is exposed to infrasound and they have never seen it like that. And the scale of the pictures is the same, you know. Korjaan sydänlihaksen pussia. Ja, ja tämä, tämä skaala on sama näissä kuvissa, eli niitä ei ole niin kuin, muutettu eri tavalla. Molemmat samassa mitta, mitta, mittakaavassa. So you might be thinking, ah, so if there's all these problems in the heart, if I have an electrocardiogram, the usual heart test, it should show up, right? 
Eli ajattelette, että jos, jos on tuommoisia ohjelmia, niin okei, se näkyy varmaan siinä normaalissa sydämen seurannassa elektrokardiogrammissa. No. Mutta se ei näy. In all of our patients, the electrocardiogram is normal. Kaikilla heidän potilaillaan tämä mittaus on ihan normaali, eli antaa normaalit tulokset. Now, I'm a biomedical engineer, so I could talk about this for three hours. I won't. Hän on koulutukseltaan biolääketieteen insinööri. Eli, eli pystyisi puhumaan tästä tunteja. But I will just tell you, if the heart is always beating, and it has a sac around it, and now the sac is very thick. Eli hän kertoo, että jos sydän käy näin, eli, eli sydän yö, ja sitten siinä on se säkki ympärillä, niin entäs kun se säkki, eli se pussi, on paksu? You will think that the heart cannot open, right? Because it has this thick sack around it now. The opening and closing function of the heart is normal despite the big sack around it. I will stop here on this because I could go on for a while, but that's it. So, so do we need to have open heart surgery to see if your pericardium is thickened because of noise? Of course not. We have ultrasound or echocardiography. And with echocardiography you can see the thickened pericardium. These are examples of a man who lives in a wind turbine home, and you can see his thickened pericardium. Even when you turn the brightness of the screen off, it's still there in the bottom picture. Eli se voi olla se paksuutuma nähdä vaikka tuosta kuvasta käännetään niin kuin valo pois, eli näette tuossa alemmassa kuvassa niin niin se näkyy tuolla alemmalla kuitenkin. So echocardiography is another test you all should get done. It's not invasive. We also found thickening of the walls of the arteries. Now, think about this. What do they say happens to you if you have too much cholesterol? What happens? What do they tell you? Oh, the cholesterol is going to clog up the blood, right? The blood won't flow and blink, you have occlusion. That's what they tell you, right? With cholesterol, right? In our cases, the, the vessel occludes, but not because there is stuff here, but because the walls get thicker and thicker and thicker and then they close. So the end result is the same. The cause is different. Today, if when people have heart attacks, today when people have heart attacks, they go to the hospital and they are quickly, normally, quickly treated. Doctors don't go to see exactly why the vessel closed, they don't care. It's closed, it's probably cholesterol. Let's give you the treatment and let's move on with life. So there's no difference. The person who goes there with a heart attack due to cholesterol or a person who goes there from a heart attack of noise is treated the same. Eli jos ihmiset menee sydänkohtauden kohtauksen vuoksi sairaalaan kolesteroli aiheuttamana tai sitten, että se verisuoni on paksuuntunut, niin hoito on sama. So that's another problem. So you're trying to treat the health of people that's close to noise. Sekin on yksi ongelma. In the 1990s, we finally came up or discovered the evolution of vibroacoustic disease. 
1990 he huomasivat tämän vibraakustisen oireyhtymän kehittymisen. Let me explain how we got to this data. Hän kertoi, kuinka tähän päivänä päästiin. There was an initial group of 306 aircraft technicians all male. 306 aircraft technicians. Eli oli 306 henkilön all male. Joukko, kaikki oli näitä näitä lentokoneteknikkoja ja miehiä. Of these 306, we took out people who had prior cardiovascular disease. Eli sieltä sitten se oli pois ne, joilla oli aiempia kardiovaskulaarisia diabetes, diabetesta, streptococcus, streptokokkia, alcohol abuse, alkoholin väärinkäyttö, neuroleptics, tai sitten ilmeisesti epilepsia. No, taking medicine, psychiatric medicine. Ah, eli kun viedään terveyspotilaita, jotka lääkitsevät. So, we took out, we took out, we took out, we ended up with 140 men clean, absolutely clean. Sitten he, siitä jäi jäljelle 140 miehen joukko, eli, eli kun he olivat puhtaita, ei ollut tällaisia muita rasitteita. Of those 140, we went to read all their medical records. He tutki näiden miesten kaikki potilaskertomukset. Remember, all these workers, they come into the Air Force Base, they have a medical center, and since day one, all the medical stuff is done in the medical center on the Air Force Base. Eli kun he tulevat sinne töihin, niin heille tehdään kaikki nämä lääkäritarkastukset ja, ja myöhemminkin niin, niin kaikki ne eh, hoidot merkitään siellä. Eli se potilaskertomus on niin hyvin kattava. So, if the symptom is on that list, it means that 70, 50% developed it. Eli nyt jos heidän näitä oireita on tuolla listoilla, niin se tarkoittaa sitä, että 50 prosenttia, eli 70 näistä miehistä oli semmoisia, joilla oli näitä oireita. You didn't put this in Finnish. No, there was no place. Sorry. They don't know what I'm talking about. Eli okay. ne ei ole suomeksi siellä ne, ne oireet, mutta, mutta niitä voidaan tietysti sitten katsoa vielä, vielä vähän. Okay. So, after five years or four years of working as an aircraft technician, 70 of these 140 people had bronchitis, whether they smoked or not. Eli neljän tai viiden vuoden kuluttua niin näillä puolilla, puolella näistä, eli niin kuin 70 miehellä oli, oli esimerkiksi toi keuhko, keuhkojen kanssa ongelmia, vaikka he olivat polttaneet. After 10 years of exposure, at least 70 had blood in the urine. Kymmenen vuoden päästä vähintään 70 miehellä oli vertaviensassa. Had chest pain, back pain, fatigue. Heillä oli uupumusta tai selkäkipua. After 15 years or more than 10 years of exposure, at least 70 people, all of them, had reduced vision, severe articulation pain, severe muscular pain. Ja sitten tässä alemmassa on näitä vakavia oireita, eli, eli sitten 10 vuoden, 15 vuoden jälkeen, niin, niin vähintään 70 miehellä oli, oli vakavia and don't think that just because you now have more than 10 years of exposure, that the stuff that began in the beginning is gone. It's not. It's still there. Eikä kannata kuvitella, että se, se mikä on, mille on niin altistunut silloin aikaisemmin, niin se olisi jotenkin hävi. Se on ihan siellä. So after 10 years, you can have throat infections and bronchitis and not be a smoker. And chest pain and back pain. And neurological disorders and all of this. So it's it's quite a picture, huh? Eli kesi na niku melkoinen kuva kun ajattelee, että on rintakipua ja on selkäkipua ja neurologisia ongelmia ja kepoja kanssa ongelmia ja niin edelleen. And this is why you get doctors thinking that people are hypochondriacs. There is not one system or organ in this list that is not complained about. Kidneys, liver, eyes, muscles, everything is complained about. Eli siinä on sitten se ongelma tavallaan, mikä päädytään, että ihmiset valittaa hyvin monenlaisia oireita, ei ole vain yksi elin tai yksi paikka, vaan siellä on kaikenlaista ajateltu, että voi sanoa, että kehossa on. Even Dr. Branko, who began this study in the beginning, he didn't believe these patients. Myöskään tämä tohtori Branko ei uskonut ensin niitä potilaita. But he gave them tests. 
Hän teki ne heille testejä. You always give your patient tests to determine whether or not your hypothesis of him being a hypochondriac is true. It might not be true. And if it's not true, it appears in the tests. Eli aina tutkitaan, että pitää se paikkansa vai vai kuvitellaanko, onko kyse luontaudista. So, who, how many of you here already live in uh, homes with uh, infrasound and low-frequency noise, or not any of you yet? Eli, eli kuinka moni teistä asuu kodeissa, jossa infraääni altistus on päällä? Nostakaa vaare. How many of you have gone to the doctor? Kuinka moni teistä on käynyt lääkäri? And how many tests have you received? Ja kuinka paljon teille on tehty testejä? Zero. None? Zero. Not any of you? Not one test? No, not, not, no, 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 no. Not tests for infrasound. Not tests for infrasound. I go to a doctor, I say, I feel nausea, I feel dizzy. Eli hän sanoo, että jos hän menee lääkärille, hän sanoo, että olen sekava ja olen uupunut. He has to give me a test, right? I might have a brain tumor. How does he know I don't have a brain tumor? Symptoms of nausea, dizziness, headaches. It could be a brain tumor. And you get no tests? Why is that? We are in Finland. No, no. I was going to wait for this uh, conversation more ahead. I have been to Holland, England, Germany, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. It's all the same. Hän luetteli näitä maita, eli Saksa, Australia, Hollanti, Irlanti, Holland, England, Denmark, Tanska. New Zealand and Australia, it's all the same. I think I'm going to mention this story now because it seems appropriate. Have you heard about the story of the US diplomats in Cuba who have been attacked or something and now they're all sick, right? Here's what they complained about. Dizziness, hypersensitivity to sound, uh, uh, balance disturbances, uh, tinnitus, uh, cognition, I can't remember, I can't think. These were the complaints. These are the complaints that people that live in homes and contaminated with infrasound and low frequency noise have. These are the same complaints. They got all the tests. They got brain MRIs. They got neuropsychological studies. They got balance and gait studies. They got ocular motor studies. <laughs> oh, you are, you're all hypochondriacs, right? <laughs> Guys, you have to start demanding from your doctors that they give you the right tests. Demand it from them. And if they don't give it to you, you write a letter, and the next consultation you go there, sir, would you please sign this letter saying that I asked you for these tests and you refused to give them to me? See how fast you get them. If they don't want to give you tests, that's fine. But then they should also be able to sign a letter saying, I'm not giving these tests because I don't want to, whatever. <laughs> okay. Respiratory pathology in people exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise or in fibroacoustic disease. <laughs> and this happens in smokers or non smokers. It doesn't matter if you're a smoker in this situation, it doesn't matter. So we started seeing bronchitis, repeated throat infections, hoarseness, 
Do you know hoarseness? When you're, you, you have a cold and the voice goes down? Very common in Finland. Very common in Finland. Normally? Yeah, it's very common. <laughs> we should study that. So, um, one of the most problematic was the cases of pleural effusion. It's basically when your pleura has an opening and you have to go to the hospital. It's not a pretty thing. But we had a lot of these aircraft technicians with unexplained pleural effusions. And that is what prompted Dr. Costello Branco to begin the study with the animals, putting animals in rats, Wistar rats, beautiful white Wistar rats, in noise to study the lung, to understand what was happening to these people that they were getting pleural effusions. So we exposed the rats, now, you have to remember, we're studying occupations. So we, oh, <laughs> you should stop. Could you please say plural? It's the, oh, never mind, it's something in your lung. Okay, okay. there's a problem okay. in the lung. Okay. Uh, atypical, not no. typical problem. Okei, eli tämä tohtori Branko halusi päästä selville siitä, että miksi nämä ihmiset valittaa keuhkojen kanssa ongelmaa, ei nyt tiedä sen lääketieteellistä nimeä. Se voisi olla ehkä ilmarinta. No, no. Uh, here's the lung. Around the lung you have the pleura, which is a very thin sac. And when this has a hole in it, okay. that's it. Okay. 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 Mutta kuitenkin niin, niin se rupeaa vuotamaan, eli se ei toimi niin kuin se kuuluisi. Hän halusi selvittää, että miksi nämä ihmiset kärsivät sellaisesta ja, ja he päätyivät rottien käyttämiseen, eli, käyttämiseen, eli, eli koe eläminä rottien. Right, I don't know what you said, so I'm just gonna, I have no idea where to pick up. So, yeah. we were studying occupational environments, so we exposed the rats to eight hours a day, five days a week, weekends in silence. Eli he, he tutkivat työperäistä altistumista, he tutkivat ja sitten samalla tavalla kahdeksan tuntia päivässä ja viisi päivää viikossa ja viikonloppuina sitten ei ollut altistusta. Occupational, right? Guess what we found? Thickening! Eli se mitä he löysivät. Again thickening. Taas tämä paksuutuma. This time, you know, in your lungs you have the alveoli. Eli alveoli. Alveoli, where the exchange of CO2 and oxygen happens. These are the walls of the alveoli. On that side, exposed very thick. The scale is the same. But we also studied the trachea. Here's what we did. This is the trachea. We take it out, we slice it, we open, and we photograph. What you are seeing is the surface where air goes through. In a normal rat. This is after the explosion. So before? This is the same trachea, but now we are focusing on that thing called brush cell. Literally a cell of the brush. Yeah, yeah. See those little things sticking up? Mm. 
They're made of something called actin. Just remember that for a moment. This is what happens to the cell after being exposed to noise. As you can see, it starts fusing together with more exposure and this is a dead cell. This is in the respiratory of the rat exposed to noise. Rats weren't smoking. There's nothing to do with smoking. But of course we also had to study the cochlea. <laughs> what you are looking at is inside the ear and what you see is a membrane with the little hair stuck to it, yes? When we hear a sound, this membrane moves and these things start vibrating. On top, there is something, another membrane. And it is when the little hairs are touching this membrane that it goes to the brain. What you are seeing is exactly that setup, but this membrane was removed. Those little hair things are also made of actin. Notice how they're all separate and individual. And notice that you have two places there with spaces where there are no hair cells. Do you see that? This is the loss of hair cells due to the normal aging process of the rat. So this is the norm. This is what happens when they're exposed. Now. You see the top membrane? It fused with the top membrane. It fused among themselves and it fused with the top membrane. The picture on the right is when we finally remove the top membrane. Look, they're all fused together. We have postulated that this is the reason why people feel annoyance. There is an organic reason for annoyance. It might not be just psychosomatic. And you know what happened to the rats? When, for Wistar rats, when you make the sound of a kiss, like that, they don't like it. And so, when they hear the sound, like that, they get very tense, they look around, what is this, they don't like it. After exposure, after exposure, you make the sound of the kiss and they start shaking, they get up on the back legs and they fall backwards. So, just to let you know that that's what happens to the rats. They don't have psychosomatic problems. So, I want to also make a point of the significant difference between people who are exposed to noise and get deaf and people who are exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise and develop other problems. If a person lost the hearing 
We all know people who have lost their hearing, yes, a little bit. And what does the person do? They get home, they want to hear television, so they put it really loud, right? And you're like, please put that down, right? This is what the deaf person does. Eli jos, jos tota niin, puuro ihminen tai huonosti kuuleva haluaa kuulla vaikka TV, niin hän menee ja kääntää sen suurelle. The person exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise gets home and turns it down because he can't stand it. Mutta sitten joka on altistunut matalataajuiselle melulle tai infraäänelle, niin, niin hän kääntää sen sitten pienelle, koska hän ei voi kestää meteliä. Completely different behavioral profile. Aivan erilaiset profiilit, eli aivan erilainen käyttäytyminen. The person exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise will isolate themselves because they can't stand the environments out there. Restaurants, movies, cars, supermarkets. Eli kun matala taajuiselle melulle ja ja infraäänelle altistuneet niin niin he he tota niin eristäytyvät. Eivät halua mennä helposti ravintoloihin tai elokuviin tai tai autoon tai tämmöisiin meluisiin ympäristöihin. They're incompatible with that environment. He tavallaan niin kokevat olevansa yhteen sopimattomia, eli, eli se ympäristö on ristiriidassa heidän kanssa. As opposed to the deaf guy who goes everywhere, right? <laughs> Mutta sitten taas niin kuuroihminen periaatteessa menee, menee niin hyvää. So I think it's important that you realize that there are very different effects of noise that makes you deaf and noise of infrasound and no frequency noise which gives you other problems, not necessarily deafness. So. Eli näissä on niin kuin sinänsä eroa, että onko, onko kyse niin matalataajuisesta äänestä, infraäänestä vai, vai sitten kuultava alueen melusta. And what do typically doctors do when you go there and you complain about noise? Normally, if they don't send you to the psychiatrist immediately, normally they give you what? An audiogram to test your hearing. Eli mitä tapahtuu, kun menette lääkäriin, niin yleensä, jos he eivät tarjoa psykiatrista hoitoa, niin, niin tarjotaan sitten kuulotestiä. Okei, so I have to give you, I always have to give two slides of cellular biology. Two slides, just two slides. So you understand why this is happening to your body. Eli hän haluaa näyttää sitten vielä solubiologiasta kaksi kalvaa, että me ymmärretään, että miksi tämä tapahtuu. So, the top on the left, that little round thing, is that what you think a cell is? A balloon? Eli tuolla vasemmalla ylhäällä on tuo kuva. Ajatteletteko, että solu on tämmöinen pallo? That's what they teach us in school. It's a balloon with things floating inside. Näinhän koulussa opetetaan, että solu on semmoinen pallo, joka sisällä kaikenlaisia juttuja keulua. If you think like that of a cell, you will never understand how vibroacoustic disease develops. <laughs> That's what a cell looks like. It's completely connected with all the other cells. It is organized in accordance with an architecture which in those movies, those are cells, and they are being um, applied different forces to these cells. And this is how the cells react when inanimate mechanical forces beats on them. Eli tässä noissa kahdessa liikkuvassa kuvassa elokuvassa näytetään, miten se solu reagoi, kun tämä eloton paineauto niihin osuu. So when this is happening to your cells in the job, five o'clock you go home. Jos tämä tapahtuu teille töissä, niin niin viideltä kotiin. Finished. Siihen se loppuu. At home? Mutta kotona. At home is always there. Mutta kotona se on aina siellä. Always there. Even when you're sleeping, and that is the worst part. Jopa silloin, kun nukutaan, ja se on se pahin juttu. So. Hey, this is just a, a word slide. I want to tell you that in our experience what we find is that people who live in infrasound and low frequency noise develop all those symptoms that you saw quicker than if you're on the job. It makes sense. You're spending more time at home, you're sleeping in the house, and you're not having any recovery periods.
If it's in the job, you leave at 5 o'clock, you're not there on Saturdays and Sundays, your body has an opportunity to recover, not in the home. So even though in occupation jobs, the <laughs> so even though the levels at in the job is very much higher than in the home, even though that's true, in the home it's more continuous. Eli se ongelma on sitten siinä, että vaikka se työperäinen altistus olisi niin kuin tasoina korkeampaa, mutta kun se kotona jatkuu ja jatkuu koko ajan, ei tule lepotaukoja. Okay, so this is the major difference between occupational and residential uh, exposure. We find that in residential exposures, symptoms develop much quicker. Eli tässä on se niin kuin perustavanlaatuinen ero tämän, tämän työperäisen ja sitten toisaalta niin kuin asumisen yhteydessä tuleva, eli tavallaan siinä mielessä ympäristön peräisen altistumisen kohdalla. Se on nopeampaa, eli, eli niissä kodeissa sairastetaan nopeammin mitä työpaikoilla. This was one of our first cases of environmental infrasound in the home. Tämä oli heidän ensimmäinen keisissä tästä ympäristö, ympäristö infraääni altistuksesta 2004. Nothing to do with wind turbines. Wind turbines is the last in a very long list of things that is causing this problem. Now it's you in the rural areas, but people in cities have been fighting infrasound for a great many years. Ihmisiä, on, on kaupungissa ihmisiä, jotka on taistellut tämän ongelman kanssa jo vuosia. So let's go to the wind turbines, which is what you're all here for, right? Elikkä sitten mennään tuulivoimaloihin. We have nothing against wind turbines. We have as much against wind turbines as we have against airports and uh, bus terminals. Heillä ei ole mitään tuulivoimaloita vastaan, että ihan yhtä vähän mitä lentokoneita ja lentokenttiä ja, ja bussiterminaaleja vastaan. This is the Portuguese case of wind turbine that went all the way to the Supreme Court. The four wind turbines were installed in November of 06 and they um, distanced from the house between 200 and 800 meters. They started rotating in November of 06. In March of 07, the parents received a letter from the teacher of their son. And the teacher was asking what is happening to this boy. He is an excellent student and now he doesn't even have energy for physical education. So by this time also the parents were feeling stuff because it had been already six months of them rotating. So they called us. And, uh, and he hired uh, a firm to come in and measure the infrasound and low frequency noise. Well, the firm came in to measure the DBA noise. We asked them, please, can you measure the infrasound and low frequency noise, which they did. They charged a lot of money, but they did it. So, so we measured the noise inside the bedroom, and here you can see the red bars are when the wind turbines are stopped, and the black bars and the gray bars are when they are rotating. Eli tässä kuvassa tuo, no, että punaiset palkit on niitä, kun tuulivoimalat eivät ole olleet käynnissä, ja sitten nämä harmaat niitä, kun, kun ne pyörivät. This is in the bedroom. Ja tämä on siellä vanhempien makkukuoneessa. So, basically what happened, the man went to court, he went to all the different uh, levels of court, and while the court was ongoing, they put more wind turbines. Okay. 
tehtiin uusia tuulivoimaloita lisää. The Supreme Court decided that the four wind turbines had to come down. So the ones in black circles, they all came down. And the one here in a white arrow, they all came down. But now he has all those other ones. Eli korkea oikeus päätti, että ne neljä pitää purkaa. Niitä on tuonne alakulmaan merkattu. And right now the closest wind turbine is 600 meters. Ja sitten näitä uusia tuuja nyt sitten niistä uusista voimaloista lähinnä on 600 metrin päässä. This man is a bullfighter. He has, uh, he uh, breeds Lusitanian horses. They're a uh, Portuguese breed. They're not used in uh, bullfights and other things. Um, and so his horses started to get sick. Eli sitten tämä mies on tota, niin, härkätaistelija ja hänellä on puhdasotuisia italialaisia hevosia. Ja any, hevoset any horse people here? alko sairastaa. Onko hevos? They started to develop what is called boxy foot. Eli niille hevosille alkoi kehittyä tämmöinen, sanotaan nyt kampurajalka, en tiedä ihan tarkkaan hyvitystä, mutta kumminkin jalka rupesi kasvamaan tuollainen box foot on englanniksi se terve. Until 2007 he had zero cases of boxy foot. Zero. Aiemmin hänellä oli nolla tämmöistä tapausta. After 2007, all the little horses had boxy foot. 2007 vuoden jälkeen kaikki hänellä oli puisilla tarsoillakin. Even the little horse that he bought in another farm and brought to his farm also developed boxy foot. Jopa semmoinen so tarsa, jonka hän osti, osti muualta ja toi sinne omalle farmille, niin sinkin, senkin jalkoihin sitten kehittyi tällä. There is a surgery for this boxy foot. The surgery was performed on some of these horses, and of course, Dr. Branko wanted biopsies to see what was happening in the tissues, to see if we could see the same thing. And guess what? We did. Eli tähän on tietysti tämä ohjelma olemassa leikkaushoitoa, mutta mutta sitten tämä doktori Branko halus ottaa kudosnäytteitä ja selvittää, että tapahtuuko sille siellä hevosen jalassa se sama juttu, mitä he aikaisemmin muualla todenneet. Ja ja näin oli. The thickening of the walls of the arteries was present in the horses. Eli näissä hevosissa oli sitten se sama ongelma, että että valtimoitten näiden verisuorten seinämät paksuutui. I don't have those slides here. I just want to tell you, both the child and the father underwent the cognitive tests. Eli sekä isä ja ja poika meni kognitiivisiin testeihin, mistä jo näillä kalvoilla. The child, it won't mean anything, but the child had 352 milliseconds, means it took 352 milliseconds for him to respond to a stimuli when the normal is 300. Eli tämän pojan se tavallaan se vasteaika, miten hän pystyi sitten niin kuin vastaamaan, reagoimaan niihin kysymyksiin, niin se oli 352 millisekuntia, kun normaali on 300. So the boy, in summer vacation was taken away from the house. At the end of the summer vacation, he was going now back to three hundred. This is the sort of test you all should get right now. Uh, how high, how effective were these uh, wind power plants? How effective? Uh, yes, it's how, how high or uh, how many megawatts? 2.3. 2.3. They're still the small ones, but they're so close. Niin, hän sanoi, että ne oli aika pieniä, mutta ne oli lähellä. Right. Um, two months ago I decided that I would show everybody these pictures. I usually used to not show them because I thought they were very horrible and I used to think that the public couldn't deal with it. But the way, thi but the way things are, are going, I think, it's, uh, I think it's time that everybody knows what's going on. So the top picture on your left is the feet of a rat who was born in our laboratory, but the mother was spent the whole pregnancy in noise. Eli tuolla vasemmalla ylhäällä on kuva rotasta, jonka eh, emo oli odotusaikana melussa. The next one down is the horses, a different horse, but the same case of the wind turbine horses. 
Sitten seuraava kuva on hevosesta. The two on the bottom are the mink from that Danish mink farm. The big thing in the tub are all dead mink. They are kept frozen as evidence. Dead mink in terms of fetuses. He has two of these freezers. I've seen them. The other little picture is this year a dead mink, fetal dead mink. So the, the mink mother aborted the fetus. On the other side, we have Australia. Nothing to do with wind turbines. Ja sitten tuolla oikealla on Australiasta kuvia, joissa ei ole mitään tekemistä taas tuulivoiman kanssa. And yet it's a home contam completely contaminated with infrasound and low frequency noise. Mutta se on kodista, jossa on, on hirveästi matalataajuista ja, ja infrarääntä. And in the top picture you can see the feet of a chicky who was born in this house. Ja tuolla oikealla ylhäällä näkyy pikkuinen tipu, joka... And in the bottom picture you see the eggs of turkeys of turkeys in this house, so they're non-viable, they're basically non-viable eggs. Okay. This is not annoyance. Uh, this cannot be assessed using a DBA. And um, it's certainly not psychosomatic, now is it? Okay. And now it's just pictures. Beautiful pictures. Almost finished. It's just pictures. This is uh, the Blue Mountains in Sydney, Australia. Beautiful, huh? And look, here's the house. Ooh, what is that? A wall. Why? This is the desperation of a family who lives with infrasound and low frequency noise in their home. The bedroom, which was on top, is now in the bottom, next to the kitchen, because they can't be up on top. Hypochondriacs? You think a hypochondriac would build a wall like this? This is Germany! Each one of those squares is a wind turbine. <laughs> okay? You see, next to the home, on that side, there's a beautiful lake. Yes. Water. This was their bedroom. From which window they could see the lake. It was a beautiful bedroom. Completely abandoned. They now live in the bunker. Hypochondriacs? <laughs> really? Right, and so my final <coughs> slide, which I think. You like that window? <laughs> <laughs> In this window, it was the bedroom of a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. Today, they are nine and seven. The seven-year-old little girl has today been diagnosed with epilepsy. The 19-year-old boy in this house has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Nineteen years old. He's never seen combat. He's not military, you know. He's just a kid. And now, finally, guess who else has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder? The farmer of minks in Denmark. So. Demand from your doctors the correct tests, and if they don't want to give them to you, have them sign a letter saying that. 
Vaatikaan. Watch him get the gift just like that. Vaatikaan niitä, niitä kokeita lääkäreitä, jos he eivät anna niin syytäkään nimisille kirjeeseen, mistä oli puhetta. Good. So, thank you.